Good evening and welcome. I'm Chris Bolzan, Executive Director of the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute, kicking off the February edition of the GMGI Science Hour. We are thrilled to be back in your living rooms with a new episode of Science Education. This evening, we welcome Dr. Gregory Skomol, Senior Fisheries Biologist of the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries with his talk, Living with White Sharks. It is exciting to have so many of you online with us. We appreciate the great feedback, ideas, and enthusiasm for continuing this series. And we are so encouraged by the tremendous appetite for science education our growing community has shown. And there are a great many new viewers tonight, including a book club from Maine. And locally, I want to welcome members of the North Shore Frogman Diving Club, the oldest dive club in America who are logging in during their monthly meeting together. And it's great to have you all in the audience. Thank you for joining us. A little bit about GMGI before I turn things over to Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combs Science Director, who will introduce our speaker and facilitate tonight's Q&A. GMGI addresses critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education by bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. Dr. Bodner's research team pursues a strategy based on a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomic technologies that is expanding our understanding of the world's oceans and accelerating discoveries that impact fisheries and human health. Our education initiative prepares recent high school graduates to become trained lab technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. We have graduated five classes and our sixth class, the class of 2022, is wrapping up their semester with the new biomanufacturing curriculum and will head off on their industry internships next month on the North Shore, in Boston, Cambridge, and one of them has even been assigned to San Francisco. Through our science community efforts, we actively promote conditions that encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. This includes the annual GMGI Science Forum returning this May in person and a second conference that we launched this fall, which focused on innovations in science education and biomanufacturing workforce development. So stay tuned and follow our newsletters, social media channels, and announcements because we have some exciting developments underway. We're hiring for a number of new positions across all areas. So if you've ever been interested in joining our team, check out the website's career page. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Andrea who will introduce Gregory. If you have any questions that you'd like to submit during the evening, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all and enjoy. Andrea? Thanks, Chris. Uh, good e evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director at GMGI, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Science Hour speaker, uh, Dr. Greg Skomal. Uh, Greg earned a PhD from Boston University and joined the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries in 1987, uh, where he's currently a senior fisheries biologist who leads the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. Greg is also adjunct faculty at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology in New Bedford, uh, a guest investigator at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and an adjunct scientist with the Center for Shark Research in Sarasota, Florida. Greg's a world-renowned shark expert, and his research is focused on understanding the life history, ecology, and physiology of shark species from around the globe. Uh, this ranges from the frigid waters of the Arctic Circle to tropical uh, coral reefs in the Central Pacific Ocean. His current research is focused on using a combination of technologies to access the physiological impacts of capture stress on the post-release survivorship and behavior of sharks. Greg has written dozens of scientific papers and has appeared on a number of film and television documentaries, including programs for the National Geographic, Discovery Channel, and ESPN. His most recent book, The Shark Handbook, The Essential Guide for Understanding the Sharks of the World, is a must read for all shark enthusiasts. Greg has been an avid scuba diver and underwater photographer since 1978, 
and has been an avid Aquarius for over 30 years, having written 11 books on aquarium keeping. Tonight, Greg's talk is going to focus on one of the most fascinating and perhaps most misunderstood marine animals, uh, the white shark. So with that, uh, I'll uh, send it over to Greg. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate the nice introduction. Um, Chris, thank you as well. I want to thank the Institute for inviting me tonight. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this conversation we have. Let me go ahead and share my screen and, and kick things off here. Just nod your head if you can see that. All right, we're up and running. Yeah, so thanks for having me. And um, uh, tonight I'm gonna focus on, on, on white sharks um, because that's been the focus of my research, uh, most intensive research we've been doing um, over the last decade. And um, the research has actually evolved over time. Um, when I first started doing white shark work, I was more um, interested in big picture types, type of questions and uh, those that we could use to better manage the species and drive con uh, conservation. But over the last couple of years, the emphasis of my research has actually shifted quite a bit. And, and that's more associated with uh, public safety and uh, Cape Cod. So this is kind of a Massachusetts specific talk, but um, our animals don't stay in Massachusetts all the time. They move up into the Gulf of Maine as far as Newfoundland and Canada, and they, they migrate south this time of year uh, when they're uh, over winter up the southeastern United States or if off um, in the central Atlantic. Um, but today I'm going to really focus and narrow my, my talk uh, and emphasize the new technologies we're using to better understand the fine scale behavior of white sharks. And I don't think it's any secret to anyone who lives in New England uh, that the number of seals has been increasing over the last several decades. And that's as a result of the passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, which is a very valuable act because seal populations like many, many marine mammal populations were driven to the brink of extinction. Um, so it's really somewhat of a conservation success story in that we have large numbers of seals that have expanded uh, into our coastal waters uh, throughout the Gulf of Maine and Canada, and uh, also as far south as Cape Cod, and as far west as, as Long Island and uh, the eastern end of Long Island. But with this growing presence of seals, we are drawing the predators of seals to our coastline, and those are primarily, at least in the Atlantic, uh, the great white shark. And so um, every day in many parts of New England and specifically off Cape Cod, we see white sharks hunting seals in very, very close proximity to the shoreline. Um, and as a result of that, uh, this is a, a very natural predator-prey relationship. Um, but as a result of that, we see white sharks overlapping with human activities. And I think it's no secret to anybody that Cape Cod draws a lot of folks who visit every year and specifically to enjoy the beaches and, and water related activities. And as a result of this, we've had in recent years an increase in the number of negative interactions between these white sharks, which are hunting their um, natural prey, the, the seals, the gray seals, in shallow water and humans. And uh, prior to recent years, the last fatal shark attack in Massachusetts was in 1936 uh, in Buzzards Bay off the coastline of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. And this is a uh, photograph of the cover of the newspaper talking about that white shark attack on a swimmer in that region. Again, going back to 1936, and this is the location of that attack by a white shark. But in recent years, starting in 2012, we've seen a relative increase in the number of these interactions. Um, a swimmer was bitten off of Truro that year. Uh, two years later, kayakers had their kayaks struck by a large white shark that bit through the kayaks and fortunately did not harm the kayakers, but it resulted in them being in the water for about a half hour before they were removed um, safely. 
Um, in 2017, a paddleboarder had the board bitten by a white shark in Wellfleet. And in 2018, a swimmer was bitten again up in Truro, uh, severely bitten, but fortunately it was not fatal. Um, but a month later in September of 2018, we had a body border um, that was killed by a white shark attack. So um, having gone so many years without a fatal attack and then having this relative increase, as you can imagine, has a lot of people concerned uh, on Cape Cod, those that run businesses, those who would like to enjoy the water. And this has really forced me to change my focus in recent years to, to try to better understand what white sharks are doing in shallow water. And, and the question is really quite simple. You know, um, We really firmly believe that white sharks don't naturally attack and kill humans. Um, this is really a result of mistaken identity. The white sharks are in the shallows hunting seals. And um, we feel that if we can better understand what drives that predatory behavior, we may be able to provide information to beach managers, the general public, public safety officials that'll help them you know, enhance public safety. And so the question we're trying to answer is where, when, and how do white sharks feed on seals? You know, what is the predatory behavior of white sharks uh, close to shore in New England and specifically off of Cape Cod? And we started this work in 2019 using a variety of technologies. Um, the approach is really you know, quite simple or seemingly simple, but it, it, it's not. Um, you know, we can observe behavior directly, uh, which is easy to do in some cases, but not so easy to do at night or in difficult weather periods. And so we have to use indirect observations as well. And, and the goal being to find patterns and, and patterns that might, not, that might be correlated with environmental conditions. So for example, is there a certain time of day? Is there a certain tide? How does water at temperature? How does current, how does depth influence the behavior of these animals when they're attempting to attack and, and feed on seals? And, and you gotta think of this relationship as a classical predator-prey relationship. It's a game of really cat and mouse, uh, kind of a sophisticated chess game. And, you know, certainly the seals don't want to be consumed by sharks and the sharks want to eat the seals. And so um, the sharks will adapt their behavior to get closer to the seals and the seals will then adapt their behavior to avoid being bitten. So it's an ever evolving predatory and prey strategy that we're trying to assert ourselves into to look for these patterns that ultimately might lead to predictability, which is what you want. You want statistical predictability that could lead to forecasting. So, you know, if we can tell a beach manager this certain time of day or this certain area, um, or under these certain conditions, white sharks are more likely to be feeding on seals, that's very useful in terms of enhancing public safety. So the rest of this talk is going to try to illustrate how we go about answering that yellow question right in front of you um, and the various techniques we use to do that. Um, and, and the methods we're, we were deploying, you know, involve acoustic telemetry, which is a, a tagging technique that's been around for decades, but has been enhanced in recent years um, to give us fine scale data over longer time scales. So I'll talk about acoustic telemetry where we have a, currently have uh, almost 180 active transmitting tags on white sharks. And I'll talk about our broad scale array and our live receivers and our fine scale arrays. And then I'll talk a little bit about short term satellite tags that we've been putting out. And satellite tags tend to give you better information on three dimensional movements over broader time scales. But I'll focus also on behavior tags, which is the latest and greatest technology. Uh, these are tags that have camera systems and highly sophisticated sensors built into them that allow us to, uh, to, to study the behavior of these animals at really, really fine scales. Not what the animals are doing from day to day, but what they're doing from minute to minute or even second to second. And, uh, and we're also deploying you know, various kinds of drone technologies. Last year, we used fixed station aerial cameras that allowed us to observe white sharks and their prey um, for over many, many hours at various places on Cape Cod. 
Um, so I'm going to dive right into these technologies and, and, and try to answer questions relative to uh, how these animals behave close to shore. Our tagging technique is what I believe is among the most benign in terms of placing tags on wild animals. Uh, also, typically, um, in many other studies that I've worked on and other researchers have, have used, you try to capture the shark or draw it close to you by chumming the water with various kinds of, of attractants. Because we work in such close proximity to swimming beaches um, and the general public, we were literally within you know, miles or even in some cases yards of swimming beaches. We use a, a technique where we go to the sharks. We use a plane to locate these animals and then while they're free swimming, in other words, we're not capturing the shark, we're not drawing its attention with any kind of attractic, attractant like bait or chum. Uh, we'll basically use the, the long pulpit of a, of a fast boat to get close to it and then place the tag at the base of the dorsal fin, which is the standard technique for tagging sharks, uh, you know, using a, a small intramuscular dart um, to hold the tag in place. And so I'll show you a, a brief video of, uh, of us tagging using this method, uh, a white shark that's swimming close to the surface. I'm out on the pulpit of the boat and I'm just gonna insert that little dart right in the base of the dorsal fin. And that's an acoustic tag, an acoustic transmitter being placed on that shark. You know, the point being, we don't wanna alter the behavior of the animal. You know, when you study behavior, you don't want to alter behavior. You know, that's, a, that's just what scientists, that's how we think. And so we want to use the least invasive technique to do that. And this seems to have worked for us for the longest time. Um, so to date, you know, since 2009, we have put out uh, two, uh, we've put out various kinds of tagging technologies on almost 280 white sharks off the coast of Cape Cod. But that also includes animals we've tagged of South Carolina, Florida, New York, um, and North Carolina, um, even though the, most of these sharks have been tagged off Cape Cod. On the left side of the screen, you'll see that we've put out 264 acoustic tags. Uh, acoustic tags will last up to 10 years, um, but the earlier versions only lasted five years. And so some of these have died or been shed by the sharks. We've used almost 70 pop-up satellite linked tags which I'll touch on briefly. And then we go into these behavior, these camera tags, which I'll spend a little bit of time on. We've got 25 of those that we've put out to date. And those have camera systems. People ask me all the time, where do you see white sharks along Cape Cod? And so on the right side of your screen, you've got a whole bunch of, of triangles that show you where we have seen white sharks along Cape Cod. So perhaps the more appropriate question, at least for the outer Cape is where have we not seen white sharks? along the outer Cape. But this also gives you a sense of our study area, okay? We're not moving into Cape Cod Bay very often. When we have, we found that Billingsgate Shoal, which is right here, as well as Brewster Flats, just south of that, are where we see the most number of white sharks. And these tend to be smaller individuals, juveniles that do not approach, approach very, very close to shore. Um, but this is what we call effort dependent data. You know, it's really tightly linked to where we look. And if we're not looking off of Duxbury or off of Sandwich or off of Hyannis, then we're not gonna see anything. And so by using acoustic tags, we can get a better sense. Those are effort independent data that we'd be collecting. So I'll show you what we learned from these tags and how they work. Um, the acoustic tag itself is really just a transmitter, all right? It's just emitting a very high frequency sound every 60, to 90 seconds, and, the, and it emits a very short series of pings that tells us, tell us the presence of the shark, but also who that shark is. So each transmitter is individually coded to the individual that we put it on. Um, the receivers themselves, we put out this array of acoustic receivers, and they have a, a detection range, and that range is anywhere between you know, roughly 100 meters up to 500 meters, depending on the amount of ambient noise. Anytime the shark swims in the, within the range of one of these receivers, and it's really only about a foot tall, and we put out this large array, that receiver will detect the shark, determine who that shark is, and simply do a timestamp. I'll then go back at the end of the season and collect those receivers, and we'll figure out where these sharks spend their time. So if we put 
a receiver off a seal colony, a haul out, for example, will determine how many sharks come to that area. A swimming beach, you know, a, a popular harbor. You know, these are the places we're putting out receivers and I'll show you where they are shortly. Um, this little video here gives you kind of a really neat animation of uh, how the technology works. You imagine each one of these little sharks having an acoustic transmitter on it. Each one of those little yellow dots represents one of our receivers. And as these sharks swim close to the shoreline next to one of these receivers, they are logging the presence of these animals. And again, we can go back to those receivers. They're not transmitting in real time. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, and we'll recreate what the sharks did at the end of the year. This is what our current receiver array looks like around Cape Cod. Now it's important for me to also tell you that we're not the only ones using this technology. There are scientists all the way up in Newfoundland, all the way down south into the Gulf of Mexico using this technology to, just, to study a variety of fish species or animal species, marine animal species and they will detect our white sharks. I'm gonna focus on Cape Cod tonight, but I could equally show you data from all over the US where our white sharks have been detected by these receivers. And I could also show you our array extending all the way up into the Gulf of Maine. Um, each one of these little white circles represents one of our acoustic receivers, okay? These are the ones that log the data and we collect at the end of the year. Each one of those yellow stars represents a live receiver. And all that means is the receiver itself has been integrated into a system that's self-charging and transmitting data in real time. So in other words, I've got those off popular swimming beaches and anytime one of our tagged sharks swims within the range of one of those receivers, it will be detected and transmitted immediately to public safety officials. So a lifeguard on that beach will get that notice immediately and they can make a decision as to whether or not they wanna close the beach or pull swimmers. Um, each one of those red boxes represents tightly compacted receivers that we put so close together that we actually triangulate the positions of those sharks. Um, and I'll talk about why we're doing that shortly. Um, so let's start to answer some of these basic questions. Let's go back to my big yellow question. When, where, and, uh, and, and how do white sharks feed on their prey? Um, let's answer the first question. When are they here? You know, are they here year round? Are they here seasonally? Well, that's really simple. We can just take our acoustic detections from all our receivers over time, over years, and simply plot out the number of detections by month. You know, late May is we, we may get a handful of one or two detections, but it really doesn't begin to ramp up until July. And then our peak months are August, September, and October. Um, and with the sharks departing fairly rapidly as temperatures drop off. So the presence of these animals is really driven by water temperature. There's a distinct seasonality, which is the case for a lot of our marine animals here in New England. You know, many, many fish species, a lot of marine mammals are seasonal visitors. As we warm up in the summertime, these animals will visit. As they, things cool off, they will depart. The prey do not depart. As a matter of fact, seals are, are around Cape Cod and in the Gulf of Maine year round. But because water temperatures are intolerable to these white sharks, as we get into November, um, they start to depart quite rapidly. And, and the latest detections we've had are generally in, in mid to late uh, December, um, when the virtually all the sharks are gone. And as they trickle out of the Gulf of Maine, they move uh, past our receivers. We may get a couple of stragglers. So very, very distinct seasonality. So if I'm a so if I'm a surfer and I don't mind cold water surfing and I'm worried about shark attack, then I, I might pick one of these off months instead of the peak months. But we all know that most human activities on or in the water are associated with the summertime. That's when our population really grows because of seasonal visitors and seasonal residents coming down to the Cape. And so um, we know there's a lot of overlap in the summertime between human activities and, uh, and the presence of these animals. So where do they spend their time? That's the next logical question. Okay, is it all over Massachusetts? Is it just certain parts of the Cape? You know, what if I manage a beach in Duxbury or in Marshfield, you know, versus Cape Cod Bay or the Outer Cape? Well, now we just simply take all of our detection data and we plot it out. And what I've done in this really simple graphic is we've taken all our receivers and we've put them on the map 
And then we've just made the size of those receivers proportional to the number of sharks that are detected by those receivers. And so you can see the outer cape is really the part, the region of Massachusetts that lights up with the presence of these animals. You can see those darker colors, the size of those, uh, those dots being relatively large. You, know, you can see in some cases 60 or 70 sharks that are visiting those areas in the summertime, you know? And uh, that gives us a sense. So again, if I'm managing beaches, you know, along the South shore, I shouldn't be too concerned about the high densities or the high abundance of white sharks versus if I'm man managing beaches anywhere from Provincetown to Chatham. And that's not to say that the Eastern side of Cape Cod Bay doesn't get white sharks, it does. You can see relatively speaking more than along the South shore. But again, the presence of these animals is really dominated along the, uh, the, the outer Cape. And that's because that's where we get these high densities of seals, you know, they're going to go where the food is. So let's take these two data sets in terms of time and space, and let's combine them looking at a single year. And here we've got a graphic and it's an animation. And what you, again, we're, we're showing you our, our acoustic receivers and up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a date, you know, that says June 2nd, 2019. These are actual data of white sharks visiting Massachusetts waters in 2019. Again, these are acoustically tagged fish, right? And so you'll see we'll march through the, uh, the entire summer and you'll see those bubbles start to expand as we get into the peak months of you know, Sept uh, August, September, and October. So now we're into mid-June. You'll see that those outer Cape receivers are starting to grow. They're swelling. You know, you're, you're seeing that the, uh, the number of detections I get, these are not the number of sharks. These are the number of uh, detections on these receivers, okay? And they can get up as high as 2,000 detections. And this is averaged per week, okay? So we're marching through the summer on a weekly basis here. And now we're into September. And again, that outer cape is really lit up. But you'll also see dots appear along the South Shore. All right, now we're into October. And these are animals that are moving through they're transient in these areas as they come and go from the Gulf of Maine. You know, not all of our sharks will stay on Cape Cod. And I, I, I tend to think of it as, you know, if you imagine you're traveling up to the Gulf of Maine from Florida for a summer vacation, you know, you might pull off the road and hit a Burger King for a meal and think of the white sharks doing similar things, you know, hitting Cape Cod and then moving up into the Gulf of Maine to continue for the summer. Or you might actually get a room for the summer on Cape Cod which some of our sharks do and they stay for longer periods of time. So you get these varying amounts of time that each of these sharks spend here. We find it really fascinating that the sharks have so many, there's so many difference be differences between individual sharks. And that, that actually is not what a scientist likes to see when they're looking for patterns. You're trying to reduce the amount of variability. And so if you have two, different, two, two, two individual sharks doing completely different things, you get a lot of variance and it makes it really hard to generalize about the species and that, that creates problems for us. But it's also from a biological point of view, really quite fascinating that some of these sharks do things dramatically different from others. Let's talk just a little bit about these live receivers. Um, these are the ones that when one of our tagged fish swims in close proximity, you know, generally within 500 meters, this receiver will detect that shark and then make a phone call basically, or send a text to the local lifeguards or public safety officials. So here we have the, uh, the receiver we placed out at Newcomb Hollow Beach. This is where the fatal shark attack occurred in 2018. You can see the lifeguard stand on the beach. Anytime one of these white sharks swims within the range of that, the lifeguards at that tower will get a, a text message as to when that shark arrives and when it departs. Now, the first thing I want to acknowledge is we haven't tagged them all, okay? So that doesn't mean there's not a shark there, an untagged shark there any given time. But what we're trying to do is have these public safety officials use this information to get a sense of how frequently the sharks are there, how long they stay when they're there, um, they use a guide to the sharks that we've given them to educate the public about which sharks are there. You know, it's a male, you know, 13 feet long that was tagged in, you know, 2018. Um, 
And then they can get a sense of what steps they want to take relative to managing the beach. You know, do they close the beach to swimming? How long do they close it for? You know, get the lifeguards thinking about, you know, um, how to enhance public safety with information coming in in real time. And, you know, ideally, I'd love to have 100 of these out there, but I don't. And that's simply because the cost of my standard receiver is about $2,000 whereas the cost of one of these is, is roughly $15,000. And so we've been able to get funding from the Office of Naval Research and others to get these receivers to test them in these areas and to get that information to these public safety officials. And again, it's just another great tool to inform you know, the public. By far the more difficult question for us to answer is more of an ecological question. It's, it's this predator, predatory behavior question. How do they go about hunting seals? And, and the, the, there's, there's no easy way to do this because as much as I'd love to be sitting on the water day and night, you know, watching the behavior of white sharks, it's simply not feasible. And it's also very costly. And so we use a variety of direct and indirect methods to do this. You know, we are on the water up to 30 or 40 times of summer, but we're out, you know, during daylight hours. And so I, ought, I right there, I've already eliminated half my day or more in which I'm not observing these animals. And that's because I can't, I can't see a white chart, you know, at three in the morning. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're already at disadvantage as to if these sharks are hunting at night, we're missing that data set. So we've got to try to fill in those gaps. Um, so, you know, we're out there and occasionally, and it's, it's more rare than you would think, because I see in some cases up to 20 or 30 white sharks in a single day in shallow water. And I see hundreds, if not thousands of seals, but I'm not seeing this happen every day where a white sharks successfully feeds on a seal. So either I'm missing it because I'm not out there or I'm not in the right place at the right time because I'm you know, off Chatham and a shark is eating a seal off Provincetown um, or they're not very good at it. You know? So there's something going on that I'm missing. Um, but when they do successfully feed, we try to collect as much information as we can. You know, what was the water depth? What's the water temperature? What's the behavior of the shark itself? You know? And so here's an instance where we've come up on a shark that is indeed feeding on a, a seal that it killed. Um, so you'll see, we'll, we'll try to uh, observe that behavior by recording it on a GoPro, um, which is a phenomenal tool because we used to have to hold the feet of graduate students and they didn't like that so much as they were filming these things. So now we can just simply use a GoPro and it's a lot easier. Um, and so here's a white shark feeding on this seal carcass. And, and what it's doing is it's gonna shake its head and it's trying to really rip off uh, that thick blubber layer. These seals are targeted by white sharks because of that blubber layer. It is rich in energy. You know, these large meals are much better to get for them, more, more um, richer in en en energy and nutrients than chasing around a bunch of fish, which is you know, a large expenditure of energy. And so it pays off for the white sharks to move into these areas, be patient, spend the time, uh, to attack and kill one of these seals and eat that blubber layer. Um, and if it's a small enough white uh, seal, it will consume the entire seal. Um, there are estimates as to what the bioenergetic value of that seal is, and they range anywhere from sustaining the shark for just a couple of weeks, which isn't all that bad, to sustaining the shark for as long as a, a month. Um, of course, we don't know. That's a tough, tough question for us to answer but we're trying to answer by using this various techniques. So we're collecting as much data from each one of these events. But as I said, we're not in all places at all times. So we're using other technologies to try to get a sense of what these sharks are doing when we're not there, you know? And one of these is these fine scale acoustic arrays that I mentioned early on. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you will see these two red boxes these are the locations where we've put these fine scale arrays. And this work is being done by a graduate student uh, by the name of Brian Laguerre, who also works at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown with his advisor, uh, co-advising with me, Andy Dandelchuk from UMass Amherst. 
And what you see below that are these two beaches um, with acoustic receivers, which are the triangles put so close together that any time a shark swims within the range or within this array, we can triangulate based on the sound from the transmitters, the time of the, the, the sound reaching each of these receivers, the exact path that that shark is taking. So is how close to shore is it coming? Is it moving within troughs? What's it doing in response to sandbars? How is it using its, the habitat to its advantage or disadvantage when hunting seals? So the other thing Brian is doing, not only putting out these receivers, but he's even putting out all kinds of, of scientific instrumentation that'll uh, not only allow us to map the area. So each of the colors you see on each of these maps re reflect the various depths in the region. So you can see where sandbars are. In the case on the, on the left, you can see uh, the sandbars are, are the yellow areas that pop right out at you. And you can see the deep trough uh, in between. Actually, it's the opposite of that. The, 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 the purple is the, uh, uh, the shallow areas, and then the deeper areas are the, are the yellow. But he can compare the movements of these sharks to those environmental features. And so he's also collecting information about currents and tide and uh, getting a set in water temperature. So what these environmental variables, how are they influencing the movements of these sharks in shallow water? I make the argument that any time a one, two, or 3,000 pound fish goes into the shallows, you know, it's doing so to feed on seals, okay? And it's, it's tremendous risk for a large fish to get into shallow water because these are very dynamic environments with shoaling, there's, there's a lot of surge, surf, sandbars, you name it. And so there's gotta be an energetic payoff. So how does the shark do that? And that's the kind of question that, that uh, um, Brian and the team are trying to answer. So here we see three weeks of data from 2019 where 31 white sharks were detected in the acoustic receiver array off Head of the Meadow Beach in Truro. That's the Northern uh, Red Square. And here you can see the individual paths of these sharks. So now Brian can you know, plot these paths and model these paths relative to the environmental conditions at that time. You know, this is just three weeks of data in 19. We've got whole summers of data from 20 and 21 and soon to be 22 with further assistance from the Park Service. So let's just look at one of these sharks, all right? So here's an animation of a white shark. Each one of the black dots represents a, uh, an acoustic receiver, again, bunched up tightly to others. And the, the dotted line represents the path of this shark. And the colors you can see are, are reflective of, of, of depth. So you can see this shark remained in the, in the trough between two sandbars off that beach. And there's a big pile of seals that typically hauls out in this area. So this shark is, is lying in wait in the deep water in an attempt to ambush any seals that would be going offshore to feed. And they have to go offshore to feed. And so the shark is using that deep trough to its advantage. You know, And it's a great example of how any lifeguard working this beach, if they understand the topography of that beach, where are the sandbars, where are the de water depths that are deep, and uh, how does that change with tide? Now you've got information that allows you to make a decision as to what swimmers should or should not do in that area. Again, providing information to public safety officials. I'm also super fascinated by these ecological observations, you know, but we're using them, you know, to try to enhance public safety. Well, I'll, I'm got, I've got one, uh, a handful of slides left to talk about how we collect indirect observation using these acceleration data logging camera tags, otherwise, I typically refer to them as behavior tags. I mentioned them early on. You know, again, how can we observe the shark, what the shark is doing in three-dimensional space when we can't be there, which is most of the time, right? We can't be there. You know, we're out on the water two days a week during you know peak sunlight hours. You know, so what's the shark doing during those other periods? And so we use these tags, which are short-term deployments. You know, the tags have a built-in camera system. They're extremely light, buoyant, and hydrodynamic. And what you see here is the tag. Um, the lens of the camera with lights built in is at the bottom of the camera. But what's also really neat about these 
these tags is they've got a whole bunch of sensors in them. Sensors that will detect the depth of the shark, the water temperature, but also what the shark is actually doing in three-dimensional space. Is it accelerating up, down, forward, right, or left? What direction is it going in, you know? It allows us to examine the behavior of these animals over very fine scales. It's collecting these data multiple times per second. So we put these tags out on these sharks for anywhere between one and three days. They're designed to detach from the shark, float to the surface. You can see the antennas at the top of the tag that allow us to collect the tag based on satellite and, uh, and radio communication. And then we're able to collect it and look at, it produces well over a million data points per deployment. So now we can characterize the different behavioral states that this shark is going into. You know, when is it actively feeding? When is it resting? When is it simply cruising in deep water? We can start to characterize that. So maybe we can answer how frequently is it accelerating to attack and kill a seal? How frequently does it come close to shore to do this? How frequently does it succeed? You know, if we know the size of the white shark population, which we're very close to knowing, we can then see how many seals does a white shark actually eat over the course of a season and how many does the population do it eat? So this is how you can take this basic behavioral information and translate it to some of these bigger questions regarding you know, the ecology of the species and, uh, and its prey and produce information relative to um, where these sharks are feeding on seals. If you look at the base of this shark's dorsal fin, you'll also see this gray tag. That's an acoustic transmitter. So the detachment point is right here um, just aft of that transmitter. The transmitter is designed to stay on for up to 10 years, while the rest of this will come off and float to the surface. So let's, let's look at an example of a deployment that we had of this uh, last year on a white shark. Um, these are three seals, relatively smart seals because they're staying in shallow water. And we find that the seals by early to mid July have figured out that something's out there that wants to eat them. And so they tend to stay for the most part very close to the shoreline until they have to go out and feed, which they tend to do at night. And here's a shark that's staying, you know, just about a hundred, you know, not even, you know, 50 yards uh, from these seals and it's hunting these seals, but it can't get into that shallow water. And if you look closely, you can see it, it has one of our camera tags. Well, we were able to observe this seal while we were out that, there as well. And it's, as our spotter pilot, Wayne Davis, was also taking incredible photos of the sequence of events that happened next. This shark eventually became incredibly impatient and decided to challenge itself by rushing at one of these seals and attempting to kill it in the very shallow water. So going into that surf zone. And here's a photograph of the shark actually doing that. With the shark on the left, the seal on the right. And this looks like an absolute successful predatory strike. Now we were able to capture this uh, in our tag as well, not only from a visual point of view, what did the shark do in the camera system, but also indirect data coming from the, the tag itself, you know, the sensors in that tag. Um, so now I'm gonna show you what it's like to ride the back of a white shark when it goes after and attempts to attack and kill a seal. And you'll see the beautiful crystal clear, and the, and the, I think the North Shore Frogmen will appreciate this, the beautiful crystal clear water of Cape Cod, where we all like to go diving, or used to. And you can see the bottom, you can barely make out the bottom. This shark is slowly moving in, now it's accelerating, okay? So it's moving, in, you'll see a reflection at the surface. It's now moving into the surf zone, and it's going after this seal. Now, for those of you rooting for the seal, you win, okay? The seal gets away. Um, and uh, the shark is still accelerating, realizes that it has not succeeded and uh, will now move out, settle down. It's, it's just wasted a lot of energy, okay? It's mobilized all its white muscle to go into burst swimming mode. And now it's gotta go back into deep water and relax a little bit, pay back that oxygen debt before it goes back in and, 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 uh, and tries again. Um, and so we can now look at what, what did this look like, not only from the camera's perspective, which we just saw, but if we went, we go through each frame and 
and we have interns that do this, we actually captured the seal. You can barely make it out now, but if I played this, you'd see it swim away. Uh, for a split second, this shark was incredibly close to the seal, but the seal got away. And once the seal sees the shark, the game is kind of over. The, the, the mouse wins and the cat has no luck. Um, but we can also look at the data coming from the tag, okay? So here's an example of a data set with a shark accelerating. Now, when we put the tag on, okay, this is depth in the first graphic, okay? Shark, the tag is on the boat, so it's not going anywhere in vertically. And then we put it on the shark and the shark tends to spook a little bit, so it accelerates in three planes. So this is the tagging event. And these other three graphics you see below it is acceleration in three dimensions, so X, Y, and Z. You know, acceleration surge is forward, sway is right and left, and heave is up and down. You can see the shark accelerating, all right? But minutes later, the shark also accelerates on two other occasions as it moves up into shallow water, which of course is one of our uh, attempted predatory strikes. This is how the data now can be used. Even if the camera stops recording, we can look at the data sets and, and get a sense of how frequently these sharks are, are, are attempting these predatory strikes. Again, correlating the behavioral observations with the camera with the data from the tags. It's a wonderful technique that's been developed over the last several years to observe behavior over very fine scales on animals where you just can't be there all the time doing it. And that's actually for most marine animals. Um, this allows us to plot these data and to look at the three-dimensional movements of this animal and recreate from the data set what the shark actually did. So you could see the data streaming on the left side of the screen, and then you could see the shark accelerating, moving into shallow water, attempting to attack and kill a seal, but in this case, failing miserably and being depressed. <laughs> and so another great method to examine how these animals are behaving in shallow water without ha us having to be there. Our ultimate goal being to take these relationships between environmental conditions, the presence of sharks attacking and killing seals, you know, link it up with real-time data, perhaps derived from a satellite, to come up with predictive maps, which is what you see here on the right side, they'll advise the public in terms of probability where white sharks are likely to be along the Cape Cod. So here on the right side, you see you know, a, a heat map where the bright colors give you a sense of where white sharks are most likely to be um, that particular day based on water temperature, which is shown on the left. This is an actual relationship that is statistically valid. We see that white shark presence increases dramatically as water temperature increases with the pivotal point being somewhere around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees as abundance increases dramatically. We then translated a real-time satellite image from that day into a probability map. So again, taking the information we learn from the, from the various tags, correlating that with environmental conditions to come up with information that's directly applicable to, um, to enhancing public safety. So stay tuned. Um, we have tons of data we're still going through. Um, I'd love to come back at a later date and show you more about what we learned relative to the predatory behavior. If you are interested in uh, looking at data and looking at our white shark catalog, um, seeing where white sharks go in our acoustic de detection database, go to the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy's website, atlanticwhitesharp.org. You'll see our, the catalog of over 500 individuals that we have documented off Cape Cod. You'll see where they go and what they do. And, uh, and you can also download the Sharktivity app. And with that, hopefully I've saved enough time to answer some of those questions that are popping up. Uh, I wanna thank a whole bunch of folks and uh, organizations that have supported the research over the years. And um, I think Andrea mentioned the Shark Handbook, which is available. It's a third edition now um, that just came out this past summer. And, uh, and kids love the Great White Shark Scientist, which talks about our research with a lot of great photos by um, Simon Montgomery and Keith Ellenbogen. So with that, I will turn it back to Andrea and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Greg. That was a wonderful talk and fascinating technology to try and understand these uh, amazing animals. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Um, so actually maybe I'm gonna start off with um, 
just one about the general changes of conditions in the Gulf of Maine with waters warming and the predictions that that might have on sharks in the future in terms of where and when they might be. Sure. You know, one of the slides I pulled out because I tend to be long winded was a historical map of, of showing where white sharks have occurred um, along the eastern seaboard of the US. And, and historically, they've always gone as far north as Newfoundland. And so I don't anticipate uh, the, any changes in white shark um, abundance uh, in terms of northern latitudes. What I would anticipate is residency changing and uh, in essence arrival and departure times. Um, as waters warm faster or stay warmer longer, white sharks are likely to stay in the Gulf of Maine longer. And for the first time this past uh, season, we had white sharks detected in the Gulf of Maine as late as January, and we've never had that before. So that might be happening. In terms of other shark species, we are indeed seeing what looks like a redistribution, or I should say a range expansion for a number of uh, subtropical and tropical shark species, including black tips and perhaps bull sharks. Uh, not as far north as the Gulf of Maine, but certainly as far north as Long Island in recent years. So I would anticipate some of these southern species as temperatures warm uh, moving farther north. Thank you. Um, an inter interesting question here. Is there a pattern or image that could be attached to the bottom of paddle boards, surfboards, or kayaks to drive off sharks? I guess, and even more broadly, is, is there anything humans can do to make themselves not attracted to sharks? Well, that, that, it's a great question, and there's no, there's no silver bullet answer, unfortunately. There's a number of companies in recent years are developing a variety of techniques. The most common for surfboards is a, is a is a, um, something you can put on the surfboard that generates a, a pretty powerful electrical field um, that is thought to deter the presence of sharks. Um, most of these techniques or technologies have not been all that rigorously tested because it's really hard to do those tests. You know, it's hard to get somebody to go out there and sit on a surfboard or, or have a shark go attack a surfboard um, without baiting it. And, and that kind of biases that research. So it's, it's a little difficult to do that. But there are a variety of techniques, none of which have been proven to be uh, particularly effective, certainly not 100% effective, and in some cases, certainly in, in not useful whatsoever. Um, people have experimented with various patterns. Black and white striping is thought to work, but I haven't seen a lot of empirical evidence of that. Um, some folks like to put big eyes on their surfboard, you know, in a, if, but the only thing I would, would say that when a, when a white shark goes into the mode of a predatory strike, remember it uses force and speed and stealth. And so it accelerates, it makes a quick decision and accelerates. I'm not sure if any of these techniques or, or, um, would work with a shark that's accelerating at 20 to 25 miles per hour. Um, I'm not sure it would deter the animal in such short notice. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Kate Castellano. Do you see any differences in behaviors in male versus female sharks and large versus small sharks? Uh, great question. Yeah, um, certainly large versus small sharks. Um, the sharks we typically see off Cape Cod and up into the Gulf of Maine tend to be larger. Um, they're subadults and adult sharks. These are, these are marine mammal scavengers and marine mammal predators. Um, until, until a white shark gets to be you know, two to three meters long, they are primarily fish eaters. So the ecology is very different in those animals. Um, so a lot of our focus has been on these subadults and adults, where we get both males and females off Cape Cod as well in the, as the Gulf of Maine. The, we don't see a lot of adult females. We see them, but not that frequently. Uh, and that could be because they're just not feeding on seals when we're out there and we haven't tagged any yet, um, or a large number of them yet or they're just avoiding these near shallow areas because they tend to be much larger. The, you, it takes, you know, you gotta be 14 feet long minimally if you're a female in order to reproduce. And those are really big fish. Those are, those are you know, two, two to 3,000 pound animals. Um, in terms of behavior, we just don't have enough data yet that indicate big uh, in, uh, sexual differences in behavior, um, but certainly in size. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from John Burns, who's asking um, about sharks in Gloucester. Can you comment on, on our area up here? Yeah, um, we get a lot of reports from uh, 
the Gloucester, Cape Ann area, Salem North. Um, we've got receivers up there. We don't get a lot of hits on receivers. The hits we do get are indicative of transient behavior. In other words, sharks aren't staying in any particular area. They're moving through up into the Gulf of Maine. Um, many of the sightings we get in those areas tend to be basking sharks or ocean sunfish. Uh, there are, we do, like I said, do uh, get occasional acoustic detections, but non-resident animals. Um, but I would say that if there are areas with high densities of seals, you know, and think of the Cape as having high densities of seals, in, the, in, in other words, hundreds of animals, you know, white sharks will pay attention to those areas and may eventually establish at least some level of residency. All right, we have so many great questions and only a couple of minutes left here. I know, um, I know, it's horrible. <laughs> You're welcome to email me questions. It might take me a while to get back to them all though. Um, okay, how about uh, Joseph Mari is asking, what are the natural predators of great white sharks? Um, natural predators of great white sharks tend to, when they're smaller, tend to be other sharks, okay? So they're born at about three, three and a half feet long. So that's a pretty big size to be born at. So you don't have a lot of natural predators unless it's a larger shark. Um, as you get bigger, you, uh, the, the number of predators, uh, potential predators drop off um, with orcas being primarily, um, and of course humans, human interactions in terms of uh, bycatch in, uh, in various gear, gears, fishing gears. But uh, orcas are, are only the only natural predator we know of, of a, of a, of a large white shark. And we don't see a lot of them around here. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I, I don't know if we can we should we wrap up? We've got uh, just one minute here. So I think we uh, <laughs> uh, should. <laughs> should we keep going, Chris, or wrap Get up? Look. <laughs> all right. Uh, we'll keep going with a couple more questions. Um, one from Hannah Sinclair. Uh, do great white sharks hunting techniques differ from shark to shark on Cape Cod? Yeah, I mean, I was talking a little bit about that. It's a little frustrating when you're looking for patterns, when you have so much difference. For example, day versus night, right? Some sharks will come into shallow areas to hunt only during the day. And then a whole bunch of others will only come in at night. So that's very frustrating because it creates a lot of uh, variability and variance. I think it's fascinating from, a, from an ecological point of view but um, when you have that much individual behavior, behavioral differences, it it, it's almost impossible, at least so far, for us to generalize um, about these animals. You know, the, some animals only stay in very small areas on Cape Cod. They almost set up territories, have their own little neighborhoods, and, uh, and they may actually be displacing other sharks. So there may even be some social dominance going on out there. But yeah, there's a lot of in intraspecific variation. Okay, uh, how about a question from Maya Logue? Can the tags detect remoras? Can they, can they detect remoras? Yeah. The tags? Yes. Um, we, so you know, if, if there's a remora, we, we don't see a lot of remoras on white sharks. We occasionally see lampreys, believe it or not. Um, if it's on the body of the shark, the tag will, you know, our camera tags at the very least, least will see it, you know. Um, but you know, that's that would be our only way of knowing there's there's any kind of, um, you know, like for example, you'll we'll see small jacks that tend to swim with the sharks. Sometimes striped bass and bluefish will swim with the sharks, um, and we'll ca capture those on our camera tags. Um, but otherwise, there's no other way of detecting them other than using the GoPro. All right, how about um, from, uh, from Chip Zeering? We heard at the beginning that you're an avid scuba diver. Have your studies made you drop that hobby? Um, and if you dive and you run into a shark, um, are there actions that you can take to lessen the dangers? Yeah, I mean, the, the only dangerous shark you're li likely to wa wander into or, or encounter here, and it's still quite rare unless you're diving the outer cape, is going to be the white shark. Um, the other species that we typically see uh, are very rarely, if ever, implicated in unprovoked attacks. Um, I will, I'll be very honest and say that my dive patterns have changed. Uh, you know, I was certified in New England. I've dove my entire life since the late 70s in New England. 
Um, but I don't do it as much as I used to, quite frankly. I have seen far too many of these animals doing what they naturally do. And I, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit uh, put off by, I, I don't wanna dive in areas where they may be. Um, having said that, you know, remember that bubble map that showed that the outer cape is the dominant area for these sharks. They will move through other spots, but they're transient and they don't spend a lot of time there. So the risk in most of these areas remains incredibly low, incredibly low. Okay, thank you so much, Greg. I think we're a couple minutes over time, so I think we'll wrap things up. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. We have so many great questions still unanswered um, and sorry that we didn't get to them all, but thank you so much, Greg, for a very uh, interesting talk, fascinating evening. Um, thank you for sharing your evening thank with you GMGI. All. Thank you, I thank the Institute for having me. Okay, I'll turn things back over to Chris to wrap up. Great, fantastic. This was a great program. Thank you, Greg, so much for so generously sharing your time, the videos, the stories. We really had so much interest. I'm getting a lot of texts and messages from people, and they're actually sharing photos with me of um, together with their friends and family watching and tuning into this science hour. So this was awesome. We hope to have you back. I'd um, love to. Oh, fantastic. We also hope you'll all come back and join us in March for the March Science Hour, where you will hear from Dr. Angel White of the University of Hawaii, Manoa. She is a biological oceanographer and associate professor with the Center for Microbial Oceanography. And if she looks familiar to you, I'm gonna put up a slide so you can save the date. She might look familiar to you because she has a very popular TED Talk on what ocean microbes reveal about climate change. So stay tuned, stay in touch. We love hearing from you and we look forward to when we can throw open the doors of our Institute and welcome you to a science hour in person once again. Thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed this evening and have a good night.